Well, it's an honor to have on comedy legend, Jackie, the joke man, Martlene on my show today. For those that don't know Jackie, he was a head writer on the Howard Stern show for 18 years and has also released several comedy albums and appeared on many movies, TV shows, and other podcasts. He has a new documentary coming out on July 18th about his life titled Joke Man, and it's really good. I think it would be interesting for Stern fans, but also just fans of comedy and entertainment, and even just Americans living out their dreams. So we're going to discuss that movie, his autobiography, and many things that were not in either of those. So this was an absolute blast having Jackie on the show. Enjoy. It moved for years, but now it's been here for 20 years. So Yeah, where is that house exactly? I am on uh, the North Shore of Long Island in Nassau County on the Gold Coast, uh, right on Long Island Sound, looking across at Stamford, Connecticut. Oh, nice. And that's where you grew up, right? That's where you were born and raised in Long Island. Uh, well, I grew up, uh, I went to high school two miles south of here, and I grew up four miles south of here. But my father's uh, sister lived here forever, so we were on the beach in Bayville my entire life. But yeah, right in the you know the North Shore, North Shore here, right in, among the wealthiest people in the world. And my grandfather was a blacksmith. So, you tell me. <laughs> wow, that's cool. Well, yeah, tell me about like the New York comedy scene in the '70s, because I'm I'm really fa I'm always fascinated by comedy or music scenes. Like, you got to be around that scene. I mean, I'm assuming the Comedy Cellar was there. What else? What other clubs were there? And what? Can no, no, no. I, I, uh, I have a very strange path. I was a musician in the 70s right. and my band told the we told jokes and played original songs. And by the end of the 70s, I realized if I wanted to eat, I better do something else. And I knew all these millions of jokes and there was no comedy scene on Long Island. At the time, uh, I had heard about Catch a Rising Star, read about it and actually went in and stood online a couple of times for no apparent reason. And um after a year being in comedy, I actually passed the audition at the comic strip. But for the most part, I was a Long Island guy, and there was no places out here. There was hmm. one variety show, and the guy, I don't know if you ever heard about this, but the guy's name was Richard M. Dixon, and he had his face surgically altered to look like Richard Nixon. True story. <laughs> what? And, and, and the variety show was at Richard M. Dixon's White House Inn on Route 107 in Hicksville, and that's where I met Bob Nelson, Eddie Murphy, Dave Hawthorne, Rob Bartlett, Bob Woods, Richie Minervini, all the guys, all the starting Long Island guys. But Dixon wouldn't pay us. So me and Minervini found a restaurant in Huntington and said, listen, you know, we'll tell jokes on Tuesday night. and We'll charge people to get in and we'll keep the money and you get the drinks and we'll have fun. And they said, OK, so the first comedy show on Long Island was at a place called Cinnamon in Huntington. And I re I recorded my first album, my first actual LP on cassette at that club, at that restaurant. And it grew into the East Side Comedy Club uh, that Richie and his brother started, which was the first full-time comedy venue on Long Island. Now, of course, the improv and Catch a Rising Star and the comic strip were in there, but the, they were you know, light years away from us. But then we started to mix and match because the guys would come out from the city because I, I was putting on shows in addition to, to the one we started at Cinnamon and Huntington. I was putting on shows any place I could find. I had an amplifier and I had speakers and a microphone and I knew how to do that because I had been a musician and I put on so many shows in so many places and that, that Everybody was thrilled to come out and work because there was no work. And these people working in the city, they're making five dollars and a hamburger and they come out and work for me and they get like 40 or 50 dollars and they get stoned and they get drunk and they chase broads and have the time of their life. And uh, that's and that's how the whole thing got started. And um, it's funny, one of the, the guy that actually brought me into the comic strip in Manhattan and introduced me around that was right in the days of sign. Uh, you know, uh, Jerry Seinfeld, Paul Reiser, Larry Miller, Dennis Wolfberg, Carol Liefer. They were all the peers of uh, my friend Peter Bales, who here it is 45 years later. And me and Peter 
we do a uh, a podcast called Stand Up Memories, and we have all the people from the new people, the old people, the wives, the girlfriends, the comedy bookers, and it's really a hoot because gee, the time just flies, man. You know, it's like wow, it was yesterday, and uh, it was really interesting. But I was never a guy. I mean, I did the Comedy Cellar podcast about three or four times. I've never been on the stage there. I only was on the stage at the comic strip a couple of times because I was money, making money on Long Island. I, I tell dirty jokes. I'm not really a comedian. I tell dirty jokes. So I, I did not have my sights set on getting a Johnny Carson because that's you don't do that on Johnny Carson. So I was making lots of money out on Long Island. Let me correct myself. What I considered a lot of money <laughs> compared to playing in the band. And, yeah. uh, and I was just a happy camper. But then I, I made my albums and I never was in the city and never did the whole thing of running around and auditioning. But I sent my three albums around and they got to Howard Stern. So I leapfrogged over the whole club circuit right on to, you know, AM radio. And then the next thing you know, we're on K Rock and all of a sudden, we're on morning drive radio and, and you know, it, we went to the moon, you know, so yeah. I kind of skipped that whole thing. It's, it's a very odd, odd well, path. Well, know? yeah. And it's interesting too. Like I th you talk about this in the book and the movie about how you made your own album. And to me, this is so fascinating because now anybody can upload an album to Spotify, but back then to know how to like physically produce, I'm still confused how you knew that. Like you couldn't Google it or YouTube it. How no, you no, it? no, like, no. It's, it's, you know, I tell everybody, if you take my life story and connect the dots backwards, it's just like backing out of a maze. It all makes perfect sense because everything led to the next thing. OK, I work at a club and uh, my band played at the same club twice a week. The guy had two different locations and he loved us. And they thought this is I might as well go into some detail. I, I they, they thought I was going to kill myself because I was so crazed over this girl. And we had the song we played all the time called the pot song that had a reprise at the end, roll up the reefer. We'll have some illegal fun. And the whole crowd <laughs> would go bat crazy. Okay. So the owner gets a bright idea that he's going to take us, let us go into the studio and record that song that maybe it'll perk me up and feel better. And meanwhile, one of the other bands that worked the same two clubs, the guy had just started his own recording studio. So we recorded the song at his recording studio. And by the time we were done, him and his partner said, you know, Jackie, you're so much fun and you're smart. Because believe it or not, we recorded the song, but then to get the insanity of the crowd, they brought the song to the club and hooked up microphones and played it back so they could get the crowd reaction to roll up the reefer at the end. And when they saw, I actually had a microphone on my foot tambourine. You know what, you know what's so funny? <laughs> That's my foot tambourine. It's just at me right there. Wow. And, and so they saw I had a microphone on the foot tambourine and we're like, I guess he gets the concept of recording. And they asked me, hey, why don't you come work for us? So I started working at a recording studio. I was just like the janitor. They called me the studio manager. I was the janitor. <laughs> but I met everybody and I learned that any moron can have a record. All you have to do is have a tape and a few dollars and what you want to write on the back and a few pictures and you, you're like making a cake and you send it. I sent it to Nashville. I'm telling you, when I went to pick up my first thousand albums in, in the Port Authority in Manhattan, I thought I had cured cancer. I couldn't believe it. Here I had my own comedy LP. I had been I had been a comedian for six months. I recorded the thing at Cinnamon at Cinnamon, which was a bar restaurant. I had a Nakamichi cassette player. Okay. When I worked at the recording studio, one of the guys put a an input in the side of my guitar amplifier with the transformer so you could play, plug a microphone directly in. So I had my microphone and my guitar into this amplifier with the two extension speakers. That went into one channel and I hung two microphones in the crowd 
but it wasn't stereo because so the left side of a cassette player was me and my guitar and the right side of the cassette player the right channel was the crowd and i record and then i'd come home and transfer the cassette onto reel to reel and with a razor blade just chopped out the bad crap i would ride the crowd up a little bit after the joke and i was very i got so good at editing with i'm talking about a razor blade and splicing tape and it, you know and it was crazy i mean i would love to have a picture of me sitting there with the pieces of tape hanging and then you drop them and you don't know which is backwards oh god it seems like a billion years ago but all of a sudden i had an album and and i'm doing gigs and we're doing gigs and i'm standing at the door I'm, i mean this is 10 or 15 years before anybody else because who else would know the only people that had albums were like bill cosby because they were signed to a record company and here i have my own record and I'm selling records at the door and the other comics, I swear to you, they're breaking my balls. Like, look at that idiot with his stupid records. What are you going to do? Stand there and hawk your records? You want a jerk. So I'm standing at the door. I'm autographing records. I'm selling for $5 a piece. And all of a sudden, the other comics are like, wait a minute. We made 40 bucks a piece tonight. He made an extra 75 bucks selling those stupid records. Maybe he's not that dumb. And for years, I sold my stuff and nobody was, there was no leg up. Nobody knew how to do it. I did a second album and I did a third. I mean, as I was putting these out, I was sending them everywhere. If I saw you on the street and you said, hey, I saw you at a comedy club, you're funny. Here, take an album. Let me send you an album. Not knowing, just, just doing whatever you could to scratch and claw. And then I heard about Howard Stern, who I'd never heard of. They told me there's a disc jockey coming to NBC in uh, New York City. I didn't listen to the radio. I was a hippie. You know, I, was a, I grew up in the late 60s. You know, I was a hippie. I listened to the Eagles and James Taylor and said in my car, I didn't listen to the radio. And I just sent my three records with everything. I'm, I'm telling you, my future ex-wife, <laughs> and, she, and she really was, my future ex-wife, Nancy, and he sent out, I'm talking three or 400 sets of three LPs and the matching cassettes and all the promo. And I'm telling you, the records cost money, the cassettes cost money, the promo cost money, the postage costs money. And by this time, thanks to my dirty dial joke, we were hosting the shows at a place called Governor's Comedy Shop on Long Island, which we actually started. And I was making enough money and we we're spending a fortune sending out all this promotion. No idea what's going to happen. And I, you know, I still have a list of the few responses I got. <clears throat> and one afternoon she says, hey, that guy Howard Stern's on the phone. He, he wants you to come into Manhattan. And I called him back and Howard got right on the phone and said, hey, we listened to your records. Everything's so funny. Why don't you join us on the air? And here I am working at Governor's Comedy Shop in Levittown. And that's Manhattan, you know, 30 Rockefeller Plaza. Not too bad. So I drove into Manhattan and walked in and there was Howard and there was Robin and there was Fred. And we laughed our asses off for four hours. And at the end of the day, Howard said, you know what? You're really funny. Why don't you come back next week? And as they say, you, could, you, you, know, you know the rest. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> so, but before that, though, when you had that first album, um, tell me this, because I think you just touched on this briefly, how Eddie Murphy asked you to help him make a record and you told them you were too busy. So were you really too busy or is that something that you would say? Cause I heard that dice talk about the scene back then, how comedians weren't friendly to each other. Like they are now. It was very cutthroat and competitive. No, no, no. That dice dice worked at pips and in Brooklyn, the guys on long Island, we were all so good to each other. It, it, there was nothing personal about it with mm. Eddie. <clears throat> I mean, I was working my ass off. And I had my hands full doing my gigs. I was promoting shows, taking my stuff out. And it was everything I could do to record my own album. And I was at the Eastside Comedy Club, which is the club that had grown out of the little show. And I had the microphones hanging and I was recording my second album called Going Ape. And Eddie saw I was doing, he said, Jack, you have albums? I want to have albums. I said, hey, sorry, Eddie, I'm too busy. And I wasn't being a dick. I mean, I wasn't a producer. I was... I was trying to get ahead as a comedian. You know, I wasn't looking to produce other guys, you know. 
<clears throat> so it's that simple, you know. Yeah. And uh, and so he was so funny, but nobody had any inkling. You know, it's funny when he was like 17 and we're at this Richard M. Dixon's White House Inn and we're hanging out like he'd be like, you know, you guys, I'm going to be bigger than the Beatles. I'm going to be bigger than the Beatles. And we'd be like, shut up, Eddie. And next thing you know, we're like, Jesus Christ, Eddie's bigger than the Beatles. So it's like, he was so confident and he and he had the talent to back it up, you know? Yeah. But but for your own story with your tenacity, you talk about that that's in the book and the movie. <laughs> Um, just how you throw a bunch of stuff against the wall. So you really were busy. So explain to me, like, uh, just like, how do you have that tenacity? Like, what do you do? Like, what advice would you have for other people? Like for myself as a podcaster, I want to get guests. So I feel like I'm always reaching out. Like, what advice would you have for me? to? You know what? To you just you scrape and you scrape. And I still, you just never stop. Like I did fine and I had some money and I, you know, <clears throat> I tell people I never changed, you know, for, I, I, had millions for a while and it never altered me. I was never a cocaine guy, a drug guy, a fancy sport, sports car guy, a country club guy. Uh, me and my wife, you know, we lived the same in 1995 when we're making a boatload of money as we lived in 1982 when we had nothing, you know, and we just both were so such hard workers. We really didn't know how to not work. And you have to have that work ethic. And I don't know if that's something you can teach somebody. All you can do is encourage somebody and, and you just don't give up. You know, there's a great story that I've been trying to get on to. Uh, I really haven't tried, but I always thought it was going to happen because Jimmy Fallon became kind of a friend. And I don't know if you read this in the book, but after a while, when you, even before I was even known, when you, do, when you decide to be a comedian, people come up, Guys, girls come up and say, I want to be a comedian. Yeah, yeah. What should I do? Yeah, I love that. And I, I finally came up with my stock answer. Because when people ask you the same thing, you, you know, not to be a dick, but you don't want to sit around and try and think of something witty. And right. I just say, give up. And they say, what do you mean give up? I said, don't even bother. You haven't got a chance. You know how hard it is? The odds? And the truth of it is, I wasn't being mean. The truth of it was, if you want to be a comic, and you say to a low life comic like me, I want to be a comic. And I tell you to give up. If that stops you, even an iota, you are not cut out to do this because you're going to hit so many brick walls so many times. So just Jackie Martling telling you you shouldn't do it, you know, should have no. And I, I read Matt Damon says this to people and Sean Young says that to people. Matt Damon says, people tell me they want to be an actor. I say, you know, there's no health plan. There's no, it's a ridiculous thing. And, and he said the same thing. If that's enough to deter them, they're not made out, made for this. So Jimmy Fallon calls the Stern show after he was in Almost Famous. And he says, hey, Howard, I never met you guys. Oh, Jimmy, thanks for calling in. He says, I almost met you guys in Albany when you were running for governor. I found out what hotel you were in. And I went to the bar and sure enough, there was Jackie standing at the bar. And I went up to him and I said, I want to be a comedian. And Jackie told me to quit. <laughs> yeah. I love Which, that part of the Fallon, book. Fallon loves that story. And every yeah. time I've ever run into him, he says, Jackie, you got to come on the show and tell that story. And then you call and you hit 15 brick walls. And I know he's sincere. <laughs> uh, but now yeah. I got something to promote. So you know what? I'm, I, I came up with a, a, how I'm going to put it in. Uh, you could be the first. This is your exclusive. I'm going to put it in Twitter or something that uh, somebody went up to Jimmy Fallon and said, that, listen, Jackie Martling has a documentary out and they just did a monument. They're building a monument to the clam diggers uh, from the Bayman's Association in Oyster Bay. And you have two choices. You, you can either put Jackie on your show or you can donate $25,000 to the Bayman's Association. And Fallon says, who do I make the check out to? <laughs> it's just funny, right? It's a great story. Yeah. Great story. So That's hopefully I'll good. get back to him. Now I have actually something to sit there and talk about besides the fact I left the Stern show. You know, I actually got something to promote and people seem to like it. So we'll see what oh, happens. Yeah, yeah, I loved it. Like I watched the movie and I was like, oh, and you talk about the book in the movie. And then I was like, wait, I, I didn't see the book. So I, I then I... I chugged through the book last night and today I just, I did on audible double speed. I listened to the whole book because if people want more after they see the movie, then they should check out the book because the book has a little more detail. Thanks. Now, listen, 
I don't know if I got your email. Make sure I get your email when we're done because I wrote two books. They mis they mis they misquoted me how much they needed. And I had enough for two books. So I have a oh. whole second book. And there's so much stuff in there that if you're a fan at all, you'll love. You know, so many people found out about my book so left-handedly. Yeah. Because, of course, Howard never mentioned it on the show. So anybody that was a fan, unless you were, for whatever reason, found out from me, it, it basically was under the radar. And then all of a sudden, the publisher called me and said, Jackie, man, did you get a huge bump in sales? What what show did you go on? What'd you do? And I said, I didn't do anything. What happened was Howard put out another book a couple of years ago. And you know, if you buy a book on Amazon, when you're just about uh, to click recommendations under, or something. Yeah, people who bought this book also bought and they're like, Jackie has a book, and they already have the mouse. One click, they get my book, my book too. And it's like 15 bucks. And so a lot of people, even people that don't like me, you know read it to, you know that's what i hope the people that don't like me are kind of come away from this movie saying you know he ain't so bad you know is it, is it kind of a love-hate relationship with stern fans do some like they hate you because howard is they, not on good are you guys on good terms or are you, are you yeah no we're on fine terms you okay. know uh we're not really on, i can't call him a friend because i haven't seen him in 20 years you know but uh we exchange happy birthday emails and you know and and the, we're fine. There's just nothing going on. And, you know, everybody wanted to make such a monstrous thing about that. I asked my boss for more for a raise and the boss said no. And I left my job. That, that really is the the nuts and bolts of the situation. Of course, you know, a lot more goes into it. But that's basically what happened. But well, people, yeah. they, they, people aren't happy with that. Well, you I'm know? so, you know, and it's I will say with the book and the movie, like, you have to believe it's honest because one of the things you put in there that I'm curious, like if anyone tried to talk you out of putting in was the thing about how you offered to come back two months later and said, no, you know what? I was wrong. I'll take that the original offer. Cause I would well, think you, that makes you kind of look bad, but you are. Uh, admitting and I don't care. Cause I have a perfectly legitimate ex explanation. I don't know if, if I'm not even sure if it was that clear to me right then, but it's such an odd thing. Okay. That show it was not like any other radio show. It was just so much fun day in and day out. And after, after being, I figure, all right, I'm on this radio show. I'm going to have the time of my life. But if I'm not on this show, I'll go sit around with other people and laugh my ass off and have so much fun. And you don't realize what a special, special room that was. And forget about it. Even compared to other radio rooms, that, that was better than a writer's room because people were listening. You know, I mean, it was an incredible situation. And that—that uh, that was the withdrawals I felt. Not any kind of fame, not money, not you know, like wow, you know, I really miss sitting there and laughing my ass off for five hours. So that you know, and I knew it. Had, too much time had passed. You know, it's—it was a very weird decision. It really was. And I—I I still don't, I still don't hold myself uh, as as being really wrong because the, the amount of money we were making, and I really did help build the fort. You know, and uh, but that's arguable. You know, people could say, "Why well, you were making five times more money than you should have?" You know, like so, it's everybody's opinion. Well, and also so. the part about how it wasn't just the money; it was also you were fried. You were fried because you were not a morning person, which I understand. I'm not a morning person either. So to wake up at four in the morning or four, whatever it was, like that would definitely wear you out. I still wonder if if they had said, "All right." we're on come in. Cause I'd left three or four times other times. And, uh, and they had come across with the money. And I remember one weekend I had left the show and it was very funny. Cause we used to always argue whether or not Columbus, Columbus day was a holiday. And <laughs> do, do we come in? Do we not come in? You know, we never know. And, and Monday, that Monday was not a holiday. And the guys came in on Columbus day and the whole weekend, like, Nancy was so happy because she was getting me back. You know, she's getting her husband back. I'm, I'm not going to be this monster that's up at four o'clock in the morning. You know, the people that suffer, uh, the people around you, you know, I, I sit down with my pen and I pump coffee. And for five hours, I am the life of the party. But on my way home, all of a sudden the caffeine and this monster comes through the door. So all of a sudden when he, Howard called me on that Monday night and said, hey, 
we got to have you. You know, I can't do the show without you. You know, we negotiated, which was very funny. And I said, hey, Nancy, I got my job back. And I, I, we actually had a fight because she was disappointed. I said, do you know how much money I'm making? What? And, you know, but she knew how she was going to have that piece of crap husband for another two years, three years, five, whatever it was, you know. But it, 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 the whole thing was, it, it was such a unique situation. It really was. And, and I really was fried. You know, I, it's funny because I, I uh, commuted from Bayville every morning for 15 years. And the way people say, oh, Jackie was never there. I, you can count on one hand how many times I actually missed the show. A couple of times I was late because I was in a hotel that didn't wake me up, you know, but it was so, so rare. And I was always there. And uh, it, I have no idea. You know, I, at one point I wanted to, I just said, I got to get off the show. I got to get off the show. Nothing against the show. And my lawyer, who was going to be my lawyer, his wife said, why don't you get an apartment in Manhattan? And I admit, you know, you can get rid of the commute and that'll solve your problem. I said, you know what? And I went and looked and I found the perfect place. And I actually was going to see a therapist at the time, which I never do. I think it was my third visit. I said, when I said, you know what, you son of a bitch, I'm going to rent that apartment. That's going to change my life because my, the show was killing, killing my marriage. It already had killed my marriage. <clears throat> Nobody told me that if you rent them in, a Manhattan apartment. Okay, I'm not in Bayville anymore. I don't have to commute anymore. But you're in Manhattan. You got this huge, fun city with all that neon saying, come play. Come. I think I slept less when I lived in Manhattan. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, and then a year later, I was off the show. You know, I kept the, I kept the Manhattan apartment for 22 years. I just, I just loved it. But uh, it I was so fried and it, you know, the show saved my life because you know, I was a drunk and you really can't, you can't be a drunk and get up at four twenty in the morning. I mean, I'm sure people think I was out. You're not, you're not out swinging from the chandeliers when you have to get up at four twenty in the morning. You're just not. Of course, I found plenty of places between the cracks to get way too drunk. And so I had a problem, but, uh, I I wonder what, it, what me and Nancy people say. Oh, she left you because you left the show. It had nothing to do with it. We were already done for years. But in my spare time, which I didn't have any of, I wasn't going to go looking for a bachelor pad. You know, I'm working five days a week, and then weekends they're dangling money in front of you that's obscene compared to what you worked for before that, and. Uh, so I'm working all week and then working the weekend and working all week. And then when I had a weekend off, the last thing I was going to do is go looking for a bachelor apartment. So we kind of, you know, we love, we loved each other. We still love each other. She's my best friend. We coexisted because I knew her before we worked together, before we had an affair, before we lived it together, before we got married, we had a whole buildup. So, you know, it was easy for us to be friends, but, uh, I, I, I can't even envision what would I, you know, sometimes I look at my house and say, wow, if I had all those millions, what would I have done to this house? And probably not much more than I did, you know, but you'll never know, you know, mm -hmm. no, you know. Well, knows? yeah. And Artie is uh, he does the forward in your book and he's in the movie as well. And uh, it was interesting. He talked about how you texted him when he was struggling and offered to talk to him. Did he take you up on that offer? I never got the follow up on that. Like, did you guys no. ever talk about? No, but he was, you know, cause when, when you're in that situation, there's really nothing, you know, it just somebody reaching out to you does 90 percent of the good, you know, just, you know, somebody if he gets on the phone, I say, yeah, I know how it is. I already said I know how it is. You know what I mean? So but I, I had no idea that that had moved him like that. So that was that was great. You know, he was very he was very generous. You know, it took so long to make this documentary that. Uh, Ian, the producer, was supposed to interview Artie, and then he got in trouble and wound up in jail and wound up in the hospital and wound up in rehab. And like, oh, we didn't get Artie in it. But the thing took so long that eventually Artie's out of the hospital. He's out of jail. He's fine. And we, Ian went and interviewed him, and, and he's in the film, which is just, you know, 
which is just wonderful. You know, I'm, I'm thrilled that he's in it. Yeah, to me, he's the highlight because he's so he's so generous. You know, which is which is really nice. You know, yeah, he's great. Well, when you had that uh, seat on the Howard Stern show, you got to see him interview. I, I think that's one underrated thing about the Howard Stern show is such how what you know what makes him such a great interviewer because it, it must now you guys were passing him notes and things. And does he also have Gary in his ear? And does he have uh, questions and research that other people did for no, he did himself? They would, they would uh, do some research on who was coming in. But uh, me and Fred would write questions for him to ask the guest. But for the most part, you know, he, he hardly stuck to those questions because we did every, I always say we, forgive me. He, Howard did everything in the moment. So whichever way it was going. So me and Fred are whipping questions down a mile a minute. Uh, so he's using them a lot more than looking down and, and what are the pre, you know, the pre prepared questions like maybe didn't fit what was going on. You know, I don't know if I said it in the book, but this people like this. I don't know if you ever noticed, but after we went on to the E show, instead of me flipping notes where Howard could see him, they put a, a lipstick camera on a little, a little uh, thing where I'd write a note and put it in the uh, basket or whatever you call it with the camera on it. And Howard had a, a computer monitor here and a computer monitor here. So wherever he was looking, he could, you know, just like a politician delivering a speech. He's got one of those, you know, teleprompters on either side, you know, looking. And uh, whenever a guest came in, Howard would always put on his dark glasses and that never seemed weird to anybody because he's mysterious Howard and he's groovy. So he's going to put on his, his dark glasses to look cool for his guests. But meanwhile, he's got a computer monitor right there with the notes that I'm writing and Fred's passing me notes. So I'm the Fred's notes too. So he's got on the glasses so he's looking over with his eyes. He's looking over and reading what we're writing, but the guest has no idea that mm -hmm. he's looking. And I, people are like, wow, I never thought of that. It's kind of funny, you know? No, that is really <laughs> interesting. It's really smart. Yeah, because when you hear, you know, there's always heard like, oh, these people are writers on the Howard Stern show. And I was like, oh, they write the skits and things. I did, And maybe some of the prepared questions. I didn't realize that you were writing stuff like on the fly. Like, that's so cool. Yeah, no, and- And you and invented that. Right. They, that's another thing that uh, I'm glad that uh, hopefully people will see that. And because it's people are so weird. Like I, I'll run into somebody and somebody, oh, boy, that was so great. I could always tell. I always knew when you were writing a joke because it'd be a pause. And then Howard would say it and then you would laugh. And I could always tell when it was your joke. And there were so many myths. People say, oh, like Jackie laughed hardest at his own stuff. And it wasn't true. I laughed the hardest at what was the funniest. So I would put up a note of mine or of Fred's or how I would say something on his own and I'd laugh and I'd come home sometimes and Nancy would say, you know, the funniest thing you wrote today is when you said uh, James Taylor is bald. And he, no, I, I didn't say that. Howard said that on his own. But you laugh so hard. I, said, I laughed that hard because it was that funny. It had nothing to do with who writes it. We're doing a show here, you know, and I laugh in conjunction with how much humor is generated by what he said. Not like Rob, Robin, every, you know, you can say somebody fell off a cliff. <laughs> How you doing, Robin? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Nothing against her. That was just his timing of device. But, uh, but it was fun doing that. But then I would run into people. I was at a show and I was sitting there by myself and I was sitting across from a guy. He says, you're checking the choke man. He said, I've been working at NBC for 30 years. I'm a cameraman. We start talking and I start explaining to him about passing notes to Howard. And this is a guy in show business for 30 years. And he had no idea what he, he didn't, almost didn't believe me. I'm like, how the hell did you think, you know, and you know what it is, people don't care. They're entertained. Who, who gives a, when Carson's talking, you're not, you're not thinking, I wonder who wrote that show. Mm -hmm. You're laughing at Johnny. You're enjoying yourself, you know? Yeah. And that was well, a very he, well yeah. kept secret for a long time. And, and Howard will say, it wasn't a secret, but trust me, it was, you know, it slowly eked out over, you know. Yeah, it, it well, was, I mean, it, especially with the, before the, I guess before the channel, because people would eventually see it, right? Didn't you say some of the guests would ask, like, 
what was it? Bruce Jenner asked, like, hey, what, what's that note you're passing? Like, oh, I'm just writing down the time. And he's, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> that was, well, that, that cha- that's my favorite, one of my favorite chapters in the book because Dom yeah. DeLuise was on. And I passed a few notes to Howard and went to commercial. And he said, Jackie, that's amazing. You guys are sharing a brain here in real time. You're, you're synthesizing jokes. That's unbelievable. And he said, and I was like, you know, I said, Dom, you know, you know, that's very flattering coming from a major celebrity like you. And then 10 minutes later, Bruce Jenner was in the same chair with that. And that was the AB situation, you know. And then we go to commercials and what are you doing? Oh, I got to tell Howard what time it is. And he actually said, that's what I thought. <laughs> so great. And I was like, oh, you moron. <laughs> was there other, what other guests like really stood out for you? I know like Les Paul, you got to meet him. Is there other ones that, because no, Les Paul was of... never a guest on the show. Les oh. Paul became my pal uh, off the show. Okay, just be, just about before I left the show. But Les Man. Paul was a huge fan of the show wow. because old people don't sleep. I remember my father never slept. Oh. He listened to Barry Gay all night. They sleep in snatches. Not to make a bad joke, and so he'd put on the Stern show. So he he knew every, and when Adam Sands, the publicist, said. Uh, Les, uh, Jack and the Joke Man's here. He got excited. And I couldn't believe that he knew who I was. It was it was his 85th birthday, and Keith Richards was there. And I went up stage, I went on stage, and at the point I hadn't quit drinking yet. And I had a couple beers in me. He said, All right, give give us what you got. And I said, Are you sure? And he said, Yeah. And I told the filthiest joke in the world, and the place went batshit. And he, you know, and we're best friends ever since until the day he died. We were dear, dear pals. Just like, like, what's the odds of that? But it was, you know, it had nothing to do with the fact that I was a guitar player. It had everything to do with he loved jokes and I knew the jokes, you know. Yeah. It's great fun. Well, uh, t- tell me about, I love the uh, the Private Parts movie. I think that made fans of Stern <clears throat> and the show for people who had never seen it or whatever, because um, they didn't have it. Uh, they didn't get uh, the Stern show in Seattle where I lived a long time. But uh, it's interesting. You, you, you talk about like the, the bathtub scene. That was actually, that wasn't Fred. That was you in real life in that. I can't scene. wait to send you the unpublished chapters. Okay. I have no I like idea. I have no idea what I was thinking of, but what was probably the best chapter I wrote, I didn't put in the book. And I have no idea how I came to that decision, <clears throat> but it's called very private parts. <laughs> And it's the whole story of how I almost wasn't in the movie and the whole tale. And you'll, you'll get such a major kick out of it. It's like, uh, and and touched on everything, like how cheap they were and how they tried to leave me out and how I didn't get credit. And, you know, all the little, all the little check marks that, and I, people didn't have any idea what was going on in the show because the things that bothered me were such little things you would people who didn't know would think like that that's nitpicking but it's not nitpicking you know dropping water on you know like the germans dropped water on people's foreheads till they gave up you know that kind of thing and uh and it, it was really interesting yeah and you know it's so funny because all of a sudden we're making a movie and i'm like howard how could you put fred in the bathtub i was the one in the bathtub and he said yeah but your wife would kill you and i was like yeah. Okay. And then, cause I don't, she almost did kill me over right, that thing yeah, in real yeah. life, but I'm like reenacting it in a feature film. I'm not sure that would have got me in trouble, but you know, was there, was it, there more of the movie that was, I thought I heard one time there was a three or four hour cut of the movie that they cut it down to two and a half hours or whatever. I, I would not be privy to that. Okay. Uh, I know. But I there did. wasn't scenes that you were in that were cut. Cause like there they, was one scene I did that wasn't that good. And I don't even know if we if finished it. Oh. But the stuff I I wasn't in that much, but what yeah. what I did what I did was in there, you know. Because your like, introduction uh, is not like one day you're just it, you're. I think your first introduction they don't show you how you join the show. They just show you doing the match game, which was a brilliant scene, by the way. I you know. What happened was, I wasn't going to be in the movie, and I don't think Fred was either. That's oh, how that's Fred? how they, had, they they, I guess they came up with the first script or whatever and howard always say hey someday we're going to be a mo- write a movie and somebody's going to write it and fred you and jack you'll punch it up it'll be great and all of a sudden he's doing a movie and all of a sudden he's talking on the air about oh, it's the greatest movie and it's the funniest movie and every scene is fantastic blah 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 and 
all of a sudden the guys are coming in each day. There's a different guy wearing a hat with an H on it. Like, what the hell's going on? They had opened a production studio and one by one, they were taking people down and putting them on camera and interviewing them about the Stern show. And I was never asked. And I'm like, what's going on? At some point I asked Stuttering John, what's going on? He said, yeah, he said, uh, I, I had to sign my, my, my rights away. And they said, don't, don't, don't mention this because every, everybody's not included. In retrospect, I think it might've been both me and Fred because there was no way that you could have me in the movie and not show what I was doing. I was making him funny and there's no way they're going to show that. So what they did was they threw out that whole thing, started over with Ivan Reitman and Howard said, I didn't like the movie the way they were writing it. So we're starting over and we'd like you to be in it. And I said, fine. And what they did was they made the movie. So it ended at WNBC. We weren't on at K-Rock. We weren't on in mornings. I say we again, I'm sorry. So it looks like they went to the moon and I stepped on the ship just as it was taken off or, or just as it was landing, whatever. Mm -hmm. If, if he had said, Robin, look who's on the show today. Jackie, Jackie Martling. I wasn't Jackie the joke man yet, but that, you know, whatever Jackie Martling. And he had to held up my three comedy LPs and said, he sent us these. Forget it. Those things would be collector's items, you know, but I was just some guy, you know, I was just a guest on the show and I happened to be there. You know, it was, uh, I, I was thrilled to be in the movie, but um, it, it didn't really depict a lot. And you'll love the story, the whole story of, of my line in the movie, which by most accounts is the funniest line in the movie, you know, how <laughs> I wrote it at, and how I wrote it and how it, came about is just so interesting and why it's not my book. It should have been the first chapter in my book, you know, but yeah, as, as you know, I'm not uh, the best at making decisions. I'm sure. <laughs> now that's funny. Self-deprecating humor. That's always the best. You can laugh uh, about some of this stuff now. Oh, please. Always, always. But is that, you know. is that, did they ever like, when you were on the show or when you left the show, like the busting balls, does it ever just go, did it ever hit, like hit home or like, Oh, that crossed the line. <clears throat> it, of course it did. If, if, if the bully's on top of you and punching you and punching you, he's going to keep punching you till you say, ow. So you eventually learn to, you know, to, to let it get to you or like he'd be going off on my wife and it'd be brutal. And you had to be very walk a fine line how you defended like the most the best way to defend against any of that stuff would be yeah but what about and and turn to fred or turn to gary or turn to robin or try, to try and twist it and Flex. get people off the subject and yeah. you know he would sometimes he'd be going off on nancy and i would write something insulting but funny and put it up there and he'd say something really funny, even though it was insulting and be a big laugh. And so he'd go to commercial, which was like, you know, taking one for the team, it, it, you know, it, but for the most part, it, the reason it didn't hurt is because if it wasn't me, it was Fred. If one Fred, it was Gary, it wasn't Gary, you know, I'm writing these notes a million miles an hour and I'm writing an insult about Gary and Howard might turn it and make it about me or turn it and make it about Fred or, you know, I always say that I thought the whole show was such a team effort mm -hmm. because as funny as what we wrote was, there was no way it could have been pulled off unless the person we were handing the notes to was as brilliant as Howard. I mean, he would swallow what was in front of him and spit it back so seamlessly. That's why people couldn't believe there were writers mm. because everybody thought it was totally on the fly. And sometimes a line was so good and we were going so fast he'd circle around and switch the topic to come back so he could use the line. I mean, it was, it was such a study. It's a shame that what I, what the actual guts of that operation was never, that should be studied because it was phenomenal. You know, like the whole thing, I don't know if you ever watch, listen to the show, but when he did Ted yeah. Kennedy, the timing, everybody's like, that is comedic timing was unbelievable. Cause Teddy was like, era, era, era. And he'd do it way longer than any comic ever would. 
He was doing that because me and Fred were scrambling to write the next thing that Teddy's going to say. So we're scrambling <laughs> yeah. to write it. And he's like, era, 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 era. Oh, my God, Joni, you're going to float away. You're so drunk. You know what I mean? It was like, it, it, it was just, it was just a wonder to behold. And then when you threw Billy West into the, into the, you know, into the works with, and Billy's got eight or nine pieces of paper on the floor in front of him. I mean, we, we were just cooking. We were yeah, it was cook, like, cook, cooking. He had such an eye for talent that he could find all these people, find yourself and all these other writers and the whack packers, and he would make them all funny. I mean, he was the director. Like you said, he was the brilliant genius mind behind all this. He was, he was not, he was not a hundred percent and he wasn't 99.9%, but he was 99%. You know, he, the, you know, he was Dorothy. He went to Oz. He picked up the people that he should have picked up. And was, I never, never taken a thing away from Howard's incredible brilliance. Yeah. And I will never know uh, why he didn't keep me on the show. And I am so sure that money was the least of the reasons. So I would you, say the you, least. You really don't know the, the real reason as to what happened? I mean, <clears throat> just from what the people told you? It, it was, it, I didn't ask for so much money that it was a deal breaker. I what I asked for was absolutely reasonable within the bounds of, of what was being made, et cetera. So did, did Robin and Fred make that? I, you know, I'm not going into the whole thing. Robin made a lot more than I did. And I I won't discuss Fred because I just uh I really do love him so much. But uh, you know, he was a good soldier. You know, he he took what they gave him. You know, and I here I am a loudmouth saying, no, you know, I'm sorry, it's not enough, you know. So but it once again it was it made the whole thing so interesting, you know. It, but it I, I like, love yeah. it. I look back at it, it's so fondly, and you know, it's so incredible because I get I get fan mail from like a kid that says I'm 24 years old and I started listening to Howard Stern and then I found the old shows from the nineties and you're my favorite character on the show. He wasn't even born when I left the show. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, uh, and it's, and it's very flattering. You know, it's very flattering. You know, I don't get, you know, 5,000 of those a day. I get one every month, you know, but that's still, you know, well, you never know. It seems like, cause when um, I, I don't know if I, I think I might've just caught the tail end of when you were on. Cause in Seattle, I don't think it came on until either, your last year or like after you left and then Artie came on and I was like, Oh, this show's so great. And then Artie left. Was there ever a talk of bringing you back? Cause they never filled that spot really after Artie. Well, left. after I left, they tried uh, a bunch of different people. They called it the Jackie chair and they'd put in people for a week at a time. <laughs> and it's funny because Artie didn't come on until uh, after nine 11. And that was months and months after I left. And people were like, wow, was that really tense? Was already coming in? You guys passing each other? And then blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, it was, it, there was no crossover at all. I was long gone before Artie came on. And there had never been a problem between me and Artie ever. You know, we were good pals. So, uh, but, that, you know, it, it's a weird situation. What I was doing was really weird. You know, people... The reason people probably had a hard time believing that I was writing so much is because I was a, a, a guy who drank too much, the smoke pot that would sit there. I had a good laugh and I was easy. It was easy to break my balls. So all that, the combination of all that almost was enough to justify me being there in the room. I, you know, they, you know, I'm, I'm the guy that breaking his balls and he's a drunk and he's, he's a comedian. And I was a character on the show. So, they didn't necessarily have to make the, you know, the leap to, oh, and he's writing too, which was, you know, 90% of my importance to the show. Just nobody knew it, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I don't know what the people did that came in. I don't know if they wrote jokes or if they just sat there, you know. Uh, well, Benji wrote jo jokes or something. He he was kind of like the intern kind of learned from you a little bit. Yeah. You know, that, that was a whole annoying thing. You yeah. know, and I actually, at some point, it actually went through my mind that you know what, he's such a pain in the ass. Maybe I should just say, yeah, I'll take, I'll take, I'll take the deal. But I don't want Benji, you know, with his thumb up my ass next to me for the whole show anymore. And I said, you know what, you can't do that. 
you know, the guy's scraping and clawing, trying to get ahead. And I, I, the last thing I'm going to do is fault somebody who's trying to get ahead, you know, especially how crazy in this business. I don't know whether his idea to come sit in there or Gary's, but, you know, he's trying to get somewhere. So, you know, that's his deal. So that had to be fine. Yeah. So you know, when you when you left Stern, did you you talked about, uh, oh, maybe I could just join another radio team. Did you have offers never, to do that? No, or? I never. It, it never crossed my mind. It never crossed my mind that um, I wasn't going to still be on the show. I didn't make any plans. Uh, I After I left the show, Nancy and I finally had time to get divorced. Uh, we had bought a beautiful home right here on the water, which is where I live now. And I quit drinking because after a month or two, I realized I, you know, I can't spend the rest of my life waiting for it to be five o'clock every day. And so the, the only solution was to have it never be five o'clock. So between breaking up with my wife and losing my job and moving into a home all by myself and quitting drinking, people say, if you do any one of those four things, you shouldn't change anything else in your life because you're going to have to adjust. And I did all four at the same time. So it was, it was a little rocky, it was a little rocky. But, uh, you know, then one day I woke up and said, wait a minute. You live in a beautiful house on the water in the most gorgeous place in the entire world. Shut up. You know, just shut up and enjoy yourself. How did you get through those rocky times without your the crutch of booze, basically? It's like, I mean, that's probably how you were getting through some of the other tough times. No. What it was is after I left the show, you know, I, I would get drunk, but I, I wouldn't wake up at 4.20 in the morning and be off to work and not have and not have an opportunity to be hung over. Mm -hmm. So I would drink too much and I would wake up so depressed because, you know, the situation, you know, there, there's no wife, there's no job. And I, I said, you know what? I can't deal with this. It was, I was unhappy. And for years, for years and years, I way back in the early 70s, I remember having a conversation with myself that, you know, one of these days we got to stop drinking. And I wrote a song about it. In 1971, I wrote a song called Three Days Rest because I try and quit drinking. And after three days, I'd be freaking out. So I wrote a song about it, you know. So it was a problem for a long time. But, you know, even that, I, I don't know how full of crap I am. Because people say, oh, you quit drinking. What was the DTs like? And I said, well, I'd never had the DTs. Well, it was, well, then you weren't a drunk. And I say, yeah, well, tell my family and my friends that, you know. And who cares? I'm not looking for labels. I'm just looking to try and make things happen, you know, make things better for myself. And, yeah, and, it, and it worked, you know. Yeah, 16 years sobriety, I think. Congratulations on that. That's got to be tough to do. Uh 22, but who's counting? 22. Oh, maybe it was 16 and you said in the book and the book is a few years old. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, wow. it's, uh, you know, it, when I was poor, when I was in high school, when I was in, in college, when I was in band in the seventies, when I was rich, when I was poor, when I was happy, I was sad, I had a nice girlfriend, got broke up with. I was really happy some of the time and really miserable some of the time. And then I got on the Stern show and was really happy. Some of, you know, my whole life, I'm really happy some of the time and really miserable some of the time. And that's that's the ebb and flow of my life and probably most people's lives. And that's you just try and learn to live with it. And it's easy to live with it, except for the parts where you don't feel good. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm right. so full of crap. You only talk long enough. I'll lie to you all day. <laughs> well, I think that's life. I think that there's there's a lot of people that have a lot more money than both of us that are miserable. There's millionaires and, and billionaires that are. Yeah, I well, see them every enough. five. I see them every five minutes. But you know what used to make me nuts is I'd be so exhausted, and I'd come out of the Stern show, and I knew that uh, we had just signed on to another year at at channel nine and my salary is going to be doubled and my gigs are tripled in price and I'm kicking ass and I'm so miserable. And I see two guys leaning on, leaning on their shovels, filling in a pothole. And these guys are laughing and having the time of their life. I'm like, what am I doing wrong? I mean, it's a million degrees and they're working with tar and they're slapping each other and laughing. It's all, it's all your head, man. It's all, it's all how you, how you rate things, I guess. I don't know. 
So have you figured out uh, how to be happier then, or maybe more grateful? Is that kind of the, the key? I've heard that's a, the key to happiness is just being grateful. Yeah. You know, and that, and that's absolutely true. And I'm so old, man. I, I just, I get up and I look out from my bedroom and I look at the Long Island sound and I look across at Connecticut. And I'm like, you know, even my, my podcast partner, Peter Bales, he says, you know, when I met you and you just starting comedy, you said, Peter, all I want in life, is to have a house on the water in Bayville. He said, and you did it. He said, you know, put your feet up and say, thank God. And like, so I put my feet up and say, thank God. And then go, when is the phone going to ring? You know, people say, did you retire from comedy? I said, yeah, I'm retired until the phone rings. And then they call and I go do the gig. You know, sometimes I drive too far for too little. Sometimes they pay me more than they should. But you just do it, you know. And, uh, you know, somebody said that, uh, it was really weird. I, I was surprised that they left it in because Stutter and John said, Jackie should have stayed around for five more years. He could have made enough money. He wouldn't have to do these gigs anymore. And somebody said, they said, if you had a billion dollars, you'd probably still do these gigs. And I said, absolutely. You know, you can't replace, you know, going up there and doing it. Whether it's good or bad, it's just something. It's not really explainable. You know, I went to therapy for a couple of years with this woman because she was like an alcohol counselor, but she was a therapist. And the only reason I agreed to see her is because I wanted to ask her, what is it that makes me feel so good after a good show? When I get laughs, wh why is that so fulfilling? W what is that stupid hole? Because you can never fill up that hole. And we... <laughs> We never got to that. We never, we never got to the well, main reason. No, I think it makes sense. I mean, that's what everyone's put on this earth for a purpose. Your purpose is literally, I mean, you're the joke man. Your, your purpose is to make people laugh. So if you're not fulfilling that, you're going to feel like a waste of space. You know, I tell people, I go down to see Larry at the post office, and I, if I fool around with him and make him laugh, you know, I'm good for a half hour. You know, I, I'm that shallow. Yeah. But, you know, I, <laughs> I my whole life, shallow. yeah, my whole life, you know, I just stood at the bar and told jokes or stood at the party and told jokes. And I wanted to make somebody laugh so hard. It was like I punched them in the stomach. He was, oh, you tell dirty jokes. I said, man, those are the jokes that get the wild reactions. You know, I'm not looking to, to be Superman or be president. I just want to make somebody laugh their balls off. And that's what I've been trying to do for forever. You know, I think you've definitely done it. Do you think, uh, I mean, your show, the show is obviously so revolutionary, a huge part of that. Do you think that the world needs something like that now because it seems like i mean people say you know you use the word woke or pc or whatever but it seems like we need somebody to come in and shake things up again and and be like unpolitically correct you think that's uh, there's gonna you be know it's, like, it's that? like that uh, that clip i think it's led zeppelin like, does anybody remember laughter <laughs> you know like i have never changed my stripes and i i'm sure if you listen to my early cds they they'll lock me up you know because they were unpolitically correct. But yeah, every, you know, everybody got to just take a chill pill. You know, when I'm doing a show, I got a Jewish guy here and a black guy there, you know, an Italian guy here, and I'm hitting everybody and the black guy's laughing at the Jews and the Jews are laughing at the Italians. You know, they, it's, it's just jokes and it's just fun. And these people get so carried away, whether it's the women with, you know, this whole thing with the pronouns and, you know, it's, it's, it's all it's all ridiculous. You know, everybody just wants to be loved. And if you want to be loved, make somebody laugh, you know, not decide what label. You know, I'm not a politician. I don't I don't want to go on and on. But yeah. And you know what? People are loving my jokes more and more and more. You know, people say, oh, you must have such a rough time on stage. I said, no, there's more people showing up than ever. You know, yeah, I, attract an, I, I attract an old audience, but that's because I'm old. Yeah. You know, so there's old people out there tonight. I said, yeah, well, I dare you to find one as old as me, you know? Yeah. And yeah, just laughter. I go on, you know, I go on the Mark Simone show and I'll tell, you know, 12 minutes of jokes that are almost way too dirty for his show. And then he coughs and chokes. And then I get a hundred phone calls. Jackie was so great on Simone because they just want to laugh. You know, people used to laugh at the, you know, ask people about the Stern show. Yeah, it was interesting. And and it was, you know, you found things out. And you heard this about this and you interviewed this guy. But the main takeaway was how hard people laugh. I love when people say, you know, I listened to that show and I used to have to pull over because I was laughing so hard. 
that is such music. They say, oh, Jackie, you must get sick of hearing that. I will never get sick of hearing that. That is the finest compliment, you know. You know, unless yeah, I said I got in a, if they said I got in an accident because I laughed so hard, maybe that would be the yeah. PS de resistance. Well, and I think for me it was I remember always because this is before podcast, so you couldn't pause a radio show. So I remember listening to Stern and I'd be in my car and I'd have to go to work or something. I'm like, I, I don't want to get out of my car. Like, cause you get like hooked. You're like, I gotta hear what, what's going on next. Like you you want to find out where it yeah. goes and and th there's no way to chase it down, you know. Yeah, yeah people say they pull over because they know they're coming to the tunnel. You know, all that stuff. It's, it's great, great, great fun, you know. Yeah, so what with this new movie, it's great. Like I said, it, I loved it so much, I went and bought your book to, to learn more. Uh, what is that? What your... That is such a... I am so thrilled that you like the movie. But the, yeah, I'm it. hoping people want to go, and because I got that whole second book ready to go, and people are like, why don't you self-publish it? And, you know, I'm, I think I'm going to self-publish it and and sell it and give the money to like the Bayman have this new statue and I say, I'm old, you know, I, I, I'm not taking my money with me. So let's, uh, let's have a little fun. My, my dream about this, and I don't know how it can happen because there's so much garbage in this. I, I can't look at anything in this room without an incredible story popping up. You know, whether, you know, there's Keith Richards and Les Paul and Willie Nelson and, Eddie Murphy and, and the Rascals Comedy Hour, you know, everything. My dream is to take this uh, documentary and show it at either film festivals or small theaters and do a Q&A afterwards because the devil is in the details. And people have so many questions about the Stern Show, even the people, the people that liked it, that hated it. So I want to show it and then do a Q&A after each showing but videotape the Q and A because the Q and A is going to be a whole nother film because there's, there's so many stories. They just go on and on and they trip into other stories. But the great thing about the stories is people were listening. There's so many people that go, I actually remember that. Whoa. I remember that. You know, it's funny. We had did a podcast the other night and um, our old friend, Bill McCarty, the great comic from 1979, I knew him. And I said, and we had the next guest, but Bill was still there. And I said, were you at Kelly Rogers' wedding? And he said, no. I said, you know, and we were off, we were done with the podcast. I said, it was, we were talking about uh, Chips Cooney. And we were talking about politically incorrect or whatever. And Kelly Rogers was a kid that was born when his father was way too old. So all of his relatives, his it, not not his grandparents, but his aunts and uncles were all very very old, and they and they were wealthy, and they had a really fancy wedding somewhere in Jersey, and all the comics went. He invited everybody, so he's all these very wealthy rich old codgers and their wives dripping in jewels, and here's all the comics. He's like, guys, we'd really like you to do a little bit. So one by one, we're going up, and I'm bite my lip to try and make it nice and everybody's making I, I was the dirtiest so I had to work on and then they put up Chips Cooney <clears throat> and this guy got up he said fuck 200 times in five <laughs> minutes the comics were like aghast and it was like the most uncomfortable <laughs> thing in the world and nobody remembers it and we get done talking and McCarty's going to, to the diner with us. And he comes over, he says, you know, Jackie, I was at Kelly's wedding. He said, that was the biggest douche chills minute that I ever experienced. Like we were all, I said, my God, I got a witness. He said, yeah, it was unbelievable. And Dom Ippolito was there. He said, I'll play it. Fuck, 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 fuck. And we're like, gee. <laughs> so great. So wow. great. So many stories like that. You're right. I think the Q&A would be uh, a movie in itself. It'd be so much fun because it'd be happening live for the people that are there and the stories would be fresh. And, uh, and we also got a place, everything is Theodore Roosevelt in this town. So they got a, a bookstore now called Teddy's. And all, like, all of a sudden they're, they're like, Jackie, you got to help raise money for the Bayman statue. And I said, you know what? The first chapter of my book is all about T Teddy Roosevelt. I'm going to ask the guy, can I come and sit there and do one of those things where people read from their books, but it's a chapter about Theodore Roosevelt and then we'll sell the books and give all the money to the, you know, to the Bayman. You know, they, it's fun. 
I'm old now, so I can do whatever I want. People are like, why did you take that gig? Because I can. You know, why would you drive three hours to work in a library? Because I can. You know what I mean? Because my mother used to say, go, you might meet somebody. And every time you go somewhere, you meet somebody else. It's interesting. So it's that simple. Very cool. Well, yeah, if you ever get to, uh, down to Phoenix or even Vegas, I could drive to Vegas. I'll come see you. That'd be really fun. Now, are you in Phoenix? Yeah. Because that, that, there was a guy there who had three radio stations, and he asked me to do jokes for him, and they had to be clean enough for radio, and I did a, a couple hundred jokes for him. He was paying me pretty good, but they were clean. And then the pandemic and he all fell apart. I don't know. I don't know where he is even now, but I think it was Phoenix or one of those Arizona. Was it Holmberg? Holmberg's big down here in Phoenix. I don't know. But I, you know, I, I'd have to look. I got to get your email address. But then one day I woke up and said, you know what? Those jokes are clean enough to put on TikTok. So all of a sudden I started loading them onto TikTok one a day. <clears throat> and the response was incredible. <clears throat> Some better than others. But one of my stupid jokes, it's funny, because I don't know about now, because I stopped doing it, because I want to use TikTok to promote Joke Man documentary. So I stopped doing it like six months or a year ago. But they don't, they don't delete you. If, you. if you do a joke that they don't like, they mute it. That's so right. Yeah. Joke, that, so they muted a joke because I said the word dildo. I was like, <laughs> Well, what? and then, and then they and then they muted a joke where I said masturbate. I'm like, this is crazy. I said, so you know what I got to do? I got to do the old thing where we do the Howard Stern K Rock dance, and I'm telling you, the jokes that have been on there have been so filthy. But you know, you could tell the filthiest joke in the world. But if not, somebody's not listening for the context. Right. You know, a girl yeah. says to the guy behind the counter in your drugstore, I need a dozen condoms. And the guy behind the counter says, oh, you want to have any kids? Huh? And she says, no, my boyfriend doesn't want to get any poop on his rocket. Okay? <laughs> so, which couldn't be any dirtier, but it slid right past them. Because the, the AI, joke, they just look for certain words. So there you right, go. The, and the dirtiest joke in the world that's on there, and I will send you the link, no, I got, saw your tickets. One of them has like 2 million or something views or whatever. One one joke in particular got 1.1 1. 1 million plays. I think and it's, it's more it, than that. It's as, as dirty as it can be, you know. Yeah, yeah. And people are flocking. People are flocking to it because you could go and you could spend the whole afternoon listening to every joke on there, you know, so Absolutely, it's fun. Yeah. It's great stuff. So, yeah, the movie comes out uh, July 18th, I believe. Yep. Yep. On, on all the major streaming platforms. Now, I don't know what that means, but it's, <laughs> I guess it means it will be pretty pretty easy to find. And when it gets closer, uh, all the details will be out there. But I'm very excited. This has been a long time coming. You know, it was, it was ready before the pandemic. And then Netflix was on the verge of taking it. And then Netflix went into the toilet. What are the odds of that? Mm -hmm. And then finally, finally, we got a distributor, random media, and... And I'm thrilled. And I just hope yeah. people love it. You know, I think the people that don't even like me are going to just go just out of curiosity. They're going to watch it. So, yeah, well, it's interesting to hear your story. And uh, I mean, I'm like a middle child. So I just I want everyone to get along. I, I love to see you go on Howard Stern and promote it. And you guys hug and and, and bury the hatchet because there's just too much too many great, great years there to, you know, I, have... I, I absolutely agree. And, you know, when my book came out, so many people said, "Boy, you were so, you know, why didn't you land to Howard? Why didn't you say, I said, because everything that happened on that show happened on that show. There was no secret that this trivial stuff that really annoyed me is, is not stuff that people are going to understand. It's way too right. subtle, you know? And just like, I don't think uh, the documentary, it's not mean in any way, shape or form, except it does show that I was writing a real lot of the stuff, which the whole world supposedly knows. So we'll see. You know, yeah. I'm thinking of sending the trailer to him, and maybe I will. Yeah. I'm sure somebody sent it to him already. So sure, for sure, we'll, we'll see thank, what happens. Thank you so much for doing my show. Um, I always end promoting a charity. Is that the, what was the thing you mentioned? The Bayman? Is that something people could donate? Uh, it, it's the oh uh, Bayman. Baymanstatue.org, I think it is. Okay, they, they, they're it. building a statue. Yeah. 
to commemorate all the clam diggers and oyster diggers throughout the centuries here in Oyster Bay. It's going to be right in the park. And, you know, and, and everybody's contributing. And, and it's a, a wonderful thing. And I'm going to probably do a charity event for them. You know, a Bay, the Bayville Fire Company and Teddy's Bookstore and everything. You know, it's a, it is a great it, it's it's a it's a great thing you know and it's very hometown you know yeah, yeah yeah i mean you're looking at you're looking at the statue and over the statue's shoulder you see billy joel's house in center island so it's you know it's pretty fantastic you know very cool well i'll send you my email hopefully you can send me the second uh book I, i'm dying to read it that sounds amazing that you are so such a generous interviewer and i really really appreciate it and i'm going to tell our publicist uh, maggie simpson that you were a delight oh good and uh and then I'm going to lie to the producer and say the guy hung up on me just to break his balls. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Jackie. I'll talk to you later. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. I don't often say this, but I was really blown away in this interview with Jackie. He was so kind and funny and openly candid about his time in Stern and how he dealt with leaving and his life since then. And I find his whole story to be very fascinating. Definitely check out that movie Joke Man on July 18th. And if you want to dive deeper like I did, I recommend getting his autobiography. It's called From Bow to Stern. And as always, you can support the guests by following them on social media and your likes, comments, and shares are always appreciated. You can support this show in much the same way. Make sure to subscribe wherever you watch or listen, especially our YouTube channel. We have a lot of exclusive content on there that's only on YouTube. And right now it's all free. So thank you for your support of our show and our guests. Have a great rest of your day and shoot for the moon.